All right, so we're about 25 minutes into it. Let's, uh, so I'll, I'll continue. So uh, as we're getting uh, the end of uh, the year and we have five or six months left, and uh, some of you guys, uh, you know, you guys will have, you're looking at your total income for the year, you're optimizing your investments or optimizing your PNL uh, based on the tax, so you have to take an action, right? So I thought it's a good idea to reflect on some of the mistakes or some of the things that we have learned over time. So you can take that and reflect that onto any uh, investment opportunity that you have. And again, I'll, I'll kind of play around with it, make some jokes, but every single thing has a, as a as an angle for it. Like a, I'll give you an example. All the pictures that we shared from the beginning of the slide, every picture had a meaning. So next time when it come about, think about, look at those pictures. Uh, we had some triple net pictures, that was ours. We have a picture of a swimming pool and a pool that is under contract. We have a picture of a building that we own. And then here we are. So in general, us real estate people, we don't like government. Big decision. But the reality is, Government is your oldest enemy till you need a friend. We live in a capitalist society. Every single system that we build, they are geared towards increasing revenue. And there is one party who's cutting the check, it's you and I. So government is your worst enemy till you need a friend. Think about that. And then you said, hey, then you take a position. Hey, what if government is my friend to begin with? I use every single ammunition that they gave it to me on my side. And then I maximize my return as I'm as I'm the one cutting the check for the whole system. Right? So it's a it's an interesting way. All right, so let's let's look at the data. And our topic was hundred transactions. Let me show you how we kind of broke it down. So I broke it down those learnings um, four buckets: underwriting, which is the acquisition side, then investor perspective, and also management perspective, and also uh, mid versus reality is called hard knocks. So I tried to synthesize as much as I could. Uh, that you know probably have captured 70 80 percent of the things that me, Mike, Sandra, and our team talks about. Uh, so I try to separate that out, and you can hopefully it's going to make sense as you go through. All right, let's look at the data. So since the question is where my hundred comes from, so I, I kind of broke it down. Uh, this is 2017. Uh, our team put together. We we buy across multiple uh, asset categories. We have land, single family, house, house that you buy rent, industrial retail, industrial retail development, single family or BTR development and multifamily itself. I separate that out that just to share a little bit more uh, how we are geared. So partners will be me, Mike and Sanja, team members will be Jasmine, Brenda, Trevor, uh, Maria and Candace put together. So you can see on the far right, I believe we have done more than 343 transactions. That means we bought it. As more than half of them sold, but we bought it across all the asset costs. So we believe our team is pretty balanced when the time comes of looking at the deal different perspective. I'll give an example. There was a deal our team was locked and loaded and heavy about it. It's supposed to clearly makes a lot of sense, like a whole team. Uh, I have a lot of single family uh, space, so I had it. Uh, then I come about, I said, look, look at the exit price. It's a it's a townhome community, and your exit price is too high. Let's check that exit price based on you know, new bills in the local area or existing house dollar per square for the local area. Because if my apartment, condo, or townhome prices is at par with the single family, then it's a false assumption because people is going to buy a house. When we looked at that angle, all of a sudden a super hot deal became a super and a cold deal, and we realize our underwriting overshot by at least a million and a half, two years, which is about 14% of the price. So having a balanced one matters. And then also it matters because unless you are in the thick of it, you don't know the pulse of the market. And then one, one set of information sets up to the another set of information, right? If you get a good pulse of the land side, you understand the development part of it, how that's gonna play out. So it's a balanced thing. Multifamily side is over 70. Uh, that's blended in LPs and GPs together, but it's more than half will be active, the other half will be the GP. So we have data set and know how on the 70 groups of people that are 70 times. Just imagine how many times you underwrote to get to the 70. Trevor alone, he can give a history of the whole thing, how many times he has been through it. Losses. 
land, we have one, single family, we have one, and we have no losses up until now. Uh, so I'll give you those losses came from me. Uh, so those losses was, it was young and dumb. So I'll give you that. So early on in 2018, when I was getting into the game, I was you know buying the process right. And there were about three times during the COVID time, I did not put my eyes on the property. So on paper, on the map, on the geotech, on the Google, everything looked out fine. I did not put my eyes on it, so I did not realize the slope of the property, and I had to exit out at a loss. Not a whole lot, but to me, it's a ding, right? Uh, single family came from me. I had a loss because the uh, the last hurricane, um, I happened, the house got flooded. I lost like five, ten, six thousand dollars, something like that. But that's the only house I lost everybody. Rest so far, so good. Again, we're talking about loss from the transaction perspective uh, when we got up. All right, so let's go back to underwriting. So underwriting or acquisition perspective top five. Does anybody get the job done? Uh, so assuming we got it. So if you're in a multifamily, you better get the job. So uh, what we call it, if you're underwriting a finance person or if you do CapEx planning and everything else, remember, we are building a pro forma. We're building a forward-looking view based on all the available information today that I understand as a best information, right? Not all information gets interpreted the same. So depending on who's the underwriter and their background and how they built up their life up until that point, by design, we'll have a bias towards the performa. Just understand that, right? So what does that mean? Uh, so underwriting perspective, the first biggest learning that we have, every single OM that you read, Assumption is, or the OEM tells you all the time, all properties run for free, insurance companies are good, like an alpha profit company, and revenue goes up just because. Right? It is the biggest thing. So in other way, you start to the OEM is wrong. It's not giving it the right data. That's your biggest take in. And again, uh, second one is every broker has a deal that will make you billions. Every deal that comes up to the market, they're going to make you a billion dollars. But you got to know the hunter person being hunted, right? especially on the entry level bus. Right? When you start getting into 7,500 doors, brokers are fantastic. I have a really good friends in the broker circle. We laugh, we joke around. But when the time comes to doing deals, remember, our fiduciary duty lies with our LP investors. Our job as a general partner is to find alpha returns for them. On the flip side, broker's fiduciary duty lies with the seller. Their job is to get the max amount of dollars for them. And by design, we are in a cross path, and which is good. And really good broker. So I'll give an example of what the really good broker looks like versus the other broker looks like. After the COVID, there was the NMAT. We went out there, market tanked. And I, I go out there. There was a broker from Houston. I, I never seen him. We sent the email. And then I was like, I know the name. You're from CBRE. And he was like, who are you? I was like, I'm Shariah. And he was like, I know the name. Then he goes, I was a jerk, right? I started laughing. I was like, yes, you were. That's because I, I was sending him so many emails and he was so busy, he didn't reply back to me. And all of a sudden he saw the openness. That's a solid player who understand how the plays out and he's still a player. Versus your broker, you're gonna get mad at you for terminating the contract and will threat you that you will never get a property in that location because you broke a contract. So and start underwriting the contracts. That's a really good thing. Good brokers will back you up. They're not going to sell you. They'll they will bring the smoke, but if you ask the right question, they'll give you the call. So you got to really understand who's being hunted where, right? And it is very dangerous for especially new ones. As a new GP, when you come in, you get emotionally vested, and once they figure out the emotion kicked in, you'll end up paying more. Uh, everything is also in Excel. I'm yet to see a property that doesn't look, uh, make money, including our stuff that we underwrite. Right? All rents are confirmed by CoStar Cubs. CoStar data is very wrong. It's not up to date. Or at the gross level, they could be right. But affected level, they're not right. There's a lot that goes in between uh, between what the rent comes are on there. So take with the bias that, hey, system run and comms are different than you make the phone call. You walk it and you shut it. And the last one is very detrimental. Uh, oftentimes we do that, which is 
someone asks for a property price $10 million, then I ask the question, okay, I cannot, the $10 million doesn't make sense, but I could pay you $10 million if the rent goes up, I don't know, $1,500, but the market tells you to go about it, right? But if you're a good underwriter, you got to say, you know, broker, I heard you what you said, but this is my offer price that is grounded by the effective rental rate in that area. So market tells me this is my rent is. Based on that, I want to make my profit. Based on that, this is my NOI, and hence my offer. So my offer is a stronger offer because of ABC. So, and you got to be comfortable in it. So for me, underwriting is this, that number five is one of the coolest things you got to know. Then one, two, three, four. And I join same as you there. All right, second one. I strongly believe that. We believe everybody's smarter than us. They work harder than us. They got better deals than us. But for us, we take the downside mitigation that as long as you're disciplined, especially on the underwriting side of it, we should be able to increase the likelihood of upside. So from the LP side, at the investor side, we are LPs, we're investors as well. We're on the both side of it, as I'll show you in the number. We forget that every investment, uh, all the investment have risks. There's nothing guaranteed. Absolutely nothing. By design, there is nothing, right? From the finance, pure, from the pure definition, every property has a risk, every execution has a risk, every GB team has a risk, market has a risk. So just understand that every investment has a risk, right? Uh, then, you know, including the stocks that you own, of the own company that you work for, uh, for 20 years, right? Uh, so, but understand that and look at the deal from that perspective. It's going to put you in a mindset is, yes, it has risk, but I understand the risk. And I have some understanding of the mitigation as well. And I have built my portfolio such a way the investments risks are distributed. Second thing is it's about the team more than the project. And within the team, it's the time and experience. Between the time and experience, it's really the time commitment. So when you look at a GP team from the LP, ask the first question, who's my asset management team? Then you ask a follow-up question, who is in the asset management team is in charge of hiring and firing the property management company? Then you look at their time and experience, you can proxy how healthy the project is gonna be in terms of execution. Uh, we can tell you also a story, but the time commitment of the asset manager and then coupled out the experience, it's really the holy grail. It's, that's the silver line of the problem. Uh, not all 17 IRR are built the same. They're not at the LP type. From the LP perspective or investor perspective, you got to understand, I use that hypothetical number 17 IRR, is that how are we constructing the IRR? Is it the cash flow? Is it the cash flow as a bump? Is it that cash up front, cash later, what the distribution looks like? So you got to have that understanding that by design will tell you the strategy of the property. So in other way, if we don't know anything about the project and just looking at the IRR and you split that between the distribution, when is the IRR being calculated, beginning of the project, the tail end of the project, you should be able to tell what the property strategy look like. Then you go back to number two and check whether that's going to work or not. Uh, narrow and single strategy, it doesn't work. It works only in the in high times, which is last three, four years that made us forget you know, what we joke around is that human cycle for remember is like roughly three years uh, or less. Then you forget. We got a taste of what the market you know, does to us. That gave us a false taste of what the strategy should be. Uh, typically, you need to have a little wide strategy as you kind of go through uh, buying a particular property type in a particular location in a particular color of the brick. It doesn't do good if the market turns a little bit. So have a little depth and a breadth on, on both of them. Uh, and the last thing is investing is an ongoing education and it's an execution process. There's nothing passive. If you're an LP investor, you are here spending your time. You're going to go interview with the GP team. You underwrite the deal for presented to you. You build a, le you know, a level of confidence that's active and ongoing education process. And if you're not in tune with the market, then it's a different thing. Most of our investors come from a business ownership or they own a business, so they're savvy already. Then you build the relationship as you go. The point is it's an ongoing education process. It doesn't matter whether an LP or GP.